Uh, welcome to our webinar on beer yeast nutrition, a deep dive. Um, I find that this is often one of the black boxes of brewing, uh, yeast nutrition. There's a lot of, you know, misconceptions out there. There's a lot of, um, you know, good common wisdom. There's also a lot of not so good common wisdom. Um, and I find that it's an area that a, a lot of brewers, you know, don't necessarily know much more than nutrients or nutrients. Um, and there's often a need to break that down and understand that a lot of problems and a lot of challenges with brewing um, come from a root cause of issues with yeast nutrition. And usually it's not enough nutrition. Sometimes it can be too much as well. Um, but this causes a lot of problems in the brewery, um, really holds you back, really holds back your yeast. So my goal here is to help you unlock the full potential of your yeast and your brewery and by extension, you as a brewer. Uh, we're going to talk about yeast nutrition. Um, so just the absolute basics of what we're putting in to uh, make our yeast ferment in beer. Uh, so that includes our sugar, nitrogen, and oxygen. We're going to talk about the role of minerals in yeast nutrition because they're really important. We're also going to talk about vitamins. Uh, we're going to talk about how to diagnose yeast nutrition issues. You know, what are the signs that you have a yeast nutrition problem and how do you solve it? And then we're also going to talk about how to optimize yeast nutrition and some of the solutions that we've created at Escarbon Labs and, you know, what you're going to see if you have correct yeast nutrition in your beer. And just to illustrate the point, you know, there's a really big difference between well-fed yeast and starving yeast. Well-fed yeast can do more than a starving yeast can. Yes, you can get away with pitching yeast into your wort without nutrients. Uh, in some cases, your wort is going to be totally okay in terms of nutrition for that yeast. But in some cases, it's not. And there's a lot of different factors that go into quality yeast nutrition. And if your wort is missing one or more of those or insufficient in one or more of those, and maybe it's even just like one mineral, over time, that yeast is going to suffer and it's going to get wimpier and wimpier. And the root cause of poor yeast uh, repitching is also an issue. All that to be said, we want our yeast to be happy and healthy. If it's well-fed, it will be. It's going to be more resilient to challenges. So even if you're repitching and uh, one of your later batches of wort is not sufficient for the yeast, then um, if the yeast is well-fed going into that, it's going to be resilient to that change. It might still survive for, uh, you know, happily perform as you expect it for a few generations versus a starving yeast that's just going to crap out on you. Okay, so we're getting into the nitty gritty. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is oxygen. Oxygen is an important nutrient for yeast. It's a little different in, in the sense that it's not, uh, it's not the same as a lot of the other nutrients where we're actually adding like a powder of something into the wort. Um, but in the case of oxygen, um, it, it is still important. And it's still being something you're adding to the wort that needs to go into solution. Right. When we talk about dissolved oxygen, and I, I'm not going to get into the details of how to oxygenate your work here, but we do have um, a, a good video on that on our YouTube um, presented by yours truly. Um, we also have some articles on our knowledge base on, on that topic of wort oxygenation. But the reason that we add it is because it's a useful, it's a critical nutrient for your yeast. It's used by yeast cells to form sterols and membranes. Um, so the fatty acid uh, lipids that go into making uh, that outer layer of the cell, the cell membrane, um, it's critical for that. It helps them form those. There's other ways to get that job done, sort of. Um, so, you know, for example, uh, some dry yeasts have some sterile content built in. So that kind of helps at least with the first generation. Um, but when we're looking at uh, liquid yeast or pretty much any yeast beyond the first generation, oxygen is a critical nutrient. And the reason for that is in addition to being able to produce uh, those those lipids that help make more cells. Um, respiration is also more efficient. So when cells breathe oxygen, they're able to produce about 18 times more energy than the fermentation process generates. So this is important. If the yeast gets oxygen up front, it can be a lot more energy efficient in making new yeast cells and switching over to start the fermentation process. Because if it makes more yeast cells, guess what? Many hands make light work, and that's true for yeast. Um, so if you're able to give it more oxygen, you'll usually get more yeast cells out. 
um, because of that energy difference. One wrinkle is that there's different oxygen requirements between different yeast strains. Um, so that's an important piece too. Some are quite flexible while others are more demanding of oxygen. And that can change from, from generation to generation. So I just threw up some data here um, from a past experiment we did where we basically tested repitching of, of a few uh, different yeast strains over 12 generations. Um, and in that experiment, we were not oxygenating the first three generations because we kind of expected it's going to be, you know, crap out or be kind of variable. Um, and that was largely true, with exception to, in this case, the foggy London. Um, if you look at the California ale, which is in red, the old world stays on in, in yellow and the Vermont in orange. Um, all of those are showing pretty, you know, variable viability when the yeast is cropped post ferment, when they didn't get adequate oxygen. And as soon as you start adding adequate oxygen, the viability is up above 90% for every single generation. So even with oxygen is the only variable, you see a pretty big difference in terms of yeast health. It's really important. We also have sugar. I'm not going to dive deep into sugar. Really, it's in a lot of cases, the sugars are fairly um, interchangeable in terms of yeast health. Um, but the bottom line here is yeast will use those sugars to convert into biomass. They'll, they'll take those sugars, break them down, ferment them, and turn all of the uh, you know, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen into other stuff. Um, what's important here is that that ratio of carbon uh, sugar to nitrogen, um, it can impact a lot of things with yeast health. So if that uh, ratio is totally out of whack, you can get some strange results. It might affect the growth efficiency of the yeast. It might, uh, it might impact the, he the um, health of the cells or the lifespan. So, you know, one example that we, we could talk about would be like a hard seltzer where you're not adding any, any actual, if you're not adding any nutrient, you're basically creating a really high ratio of carbon to nitrogen and okay. Yeah. The cells can get their carbon, but they're not getting nitrogen. So there's a lot of things they can't do. They can't make the whole system's out of balance and you get either a really slow ferment or a ferment that doesn't take off or a hard seltzer that smells like farts. So the solution to that is make sure that there's the right balance of carbon to nitrogen. So we get into nitrogen, and this is where we really start diving deep into yeast nutrition. Uh, where do we get that from? Um, we get that from malt for the most part. So malt is a great source of what we call free amino nitrogen or FAN. You'll probably hear me say FAN like 45 times in this talk. So uh, free amino nitrogen. What that means is that's just individual amino acids uh, that are available to the yeast uh, to take up, grow. They basically bring those inside the cell and they can use those as building blocks or like Lego pieces to assemble into new proteins. And proteins are basically, proteins and enzymes are the things that do all, all, almost all of the activities within the cell. Um, so it's really, really important. When we're talking about beer, we tend to talk about fan, uh, free amino nitrogen. If you uh, look across to the wine world and the wine literature, you'll see them talking about yan, yeast assimilable nitrogen. The difference is that in wine, for example, um, in addition to free amino nitrogen from the grapes, you also have um, ammonia, ammonium. Um, so just a different source of nitrogen, essentially. And so in the wine world, they'll often talk about yan, which is fan plus ammonium. Um, but in the case of beer, there tends to not be a whole lot of ammonium. So we tend to just talk about fan um, as, our, as our yeast nutrition. Um, but yeah, if you're getting over into wine and seltzer and things like that, that's where you might see that term instead. Um, yeast nutrients are, are really common additives, um, especially in, you know, wine and cider and seltzer, but, but certainly also in brewing. Um, they often do contain some source of fan. Um, usually it's yeast derived. Um, sometimes it might be derived from malt or, uh, or other plant matter. Um, it may contain ammonium, a uh, really, really common yeast nutrient um, or yeast nutrient ingredient is diammonium phosphate or DAP. Um, that's literally just two molecules of ammonium uh, slapped together with one molecule of phosphate. So that's actually a pretty useful yeast nutrient because it just so happens that yeast needs a lot of nitrogen and a lot of phosphate. So it can be effective. Um, or even urea. You, you see that a lot on, on the fuel side or, you know, in some nutrient products. 
Um, but I will caution that you do get what you pay for. Um, especially, you know, here in Ontario where, um, the LCBO does check alcoholic products for this thing called ethyl carbamate. Um, that's a potential carcinogen and, and it is known that if you are feeding yeast with urea in the presence of alcohol, um, you can get elevated levels of that. So that's always something to watch out for. Um, there's a few breweries who have, who have run into this issue. So they've had to make adjustments in their process. Um, but yeah, bottom line is you're getting the vast majority of your nitrogen um, in, in, in the typical beer from your malt. And you might be supplementing a little bit of that with a yeast nutrient as well. The fan requirements of yeast does depend on the strains. So that's where things start to get complicated. Um, we've been able to do a fair bit of measurement on our strains because this is really, really important, right? It's like yeast nutrition is not a one size fits all approach, which makes this topic complicated overall. Um, I'm sorry, but it's complicated. Um, there's big differences between different yeast strains, whether that's on a family basis or whether that's on an individual strain basis. So um, we have done our best to try to make that information available. So you can find this information on our uh, knowledge base uh, website. Um, and in general, there are some fairly common themes here. So if you look at the graph on the right, you can see, for example, um, some of the Belgian strains are actually quite high nutrient requiring strains. Whereas if you look at the loggers, they're actually, for the most part, on the low end. You know, none of them are more than, you know, 50 percent um, of, of the total pool of strains that we're looking at here. And then you have other strains in the middle, like your British strains and your Kvikes. So we, we actually can classify based on the strain type or the strain, strain origin, uh, which is quite helpful. But there are, of course, some outliers, right? If you look at the Saison group, you can see that there's, you know, there's one strain that's quite a high nutrient requirement and one that's, that's, you know, a fair bit lower. So it is, you know, not even necessarily group specific, it can be strain specific. Um, so it's important to have the strain specific data. In general, we would classify a low requiring strain as one that needs 100 to 150 parts per million of fan. You're going to get that from pretty much any wart um, without major issues. So that's that that makes those pretty easy to use. So logger strains are, are, are that example. Um, they're on the low end of fan requirement, which is great. It can make a low strength wart with European malts and, and tend to have no problems with, at least with fan. Um, the medium fan requiring strains tend to be in that 150 to 175 parts per million range. So that's um, largely Kvike and, um, you know, Hefeweizen and uh, British strains. Um, they have sort of a medium requirement of fan. They might have other quirks though, right? Like a lot of the British strains require a lot of oxygen for good performance, for example. Um, and then there's also high fan requiring strains. So that's a lot of, as you can see, a lot of the Belgian strains, for example, we don't always think of it that way, but these strains are quite hungry. And, you know, if you've ever made a, you know, a, especially when you get into the lower uh, gravity warts, like if you've ever made a wit beer or, you know, a table beer and it's ended up super sulfury, um, that's what's going on. The, the yeast didn't get enough nitrogen. So you suffered the consequences. Um, and we can even break that down strain by strain. Um, you can find this graph on our knowledge base website. So feel free to check that out. If you're using a, a strain for the first time, you can look it up in the, the graph and know, okay, uh, this is exactly how much fan it's going to use in the wart. So really, really useful, um, especially with those strains that are on the higher end, because you want to make sure that they're fed properly. Otherwise, you might see some, some issues with flavor or performance. So what actually controls fan in your wort? Um, part of it is just concentration, right? Your fan is coming from your malt. So it stands to reason that with the higher original gravity, meaning more malt, you're going to get more fan, which is, which is true. Um, you can see that in the graph on the right. Um, the warts with higher specific gravity um, tend to have a higher fan content. And it's fairly linear to a point. We didn't go stronger in that example, but you will sort of see that um, eventually taper off. Like you do get some diminishing returns eventually, um, partially just because, you know, you're adding more and more malt. Eventually you're running up against, you know, solubility in the mash itself, right? Mash thickness and stuff like that. Um, but in general, if you're running a, a higher original gravity, you're going to have more fan uh, in the wort. Um, and it is fairly linear. 
Um, if you're getting more enzymatic breakdown in your mash, so if you're doing a protein rest or like any step mash, um, that is that includes a temperature favoring those protease peptidase enzymes, you're probably also going to get more fan because like there's been some pre-digestion of protein in the malting process, but in your mashing process, you can continue to activate those enzymes and uh, break down protein and peptides, which are basically like mini proteins into fan, which are free amino acids. So how you mash is also going to uh, change this quite a bit. Um, so, you know, one, uh, one thing I always suggest with, with lower gravity warts is that those are, those are often the ones that need more fan. Um, we often don't think about that, but um, that's, that's the hill that I will die on is that low, low gravity warts tend to need more yeast nutrition added than high gravity warts do, especially if it's all malt beer, because malt is quite rich in most of the nutrients we need uh, for proper beer fermentation. If we're pitching a high nitrogen requiring strain in a low gravity wort, that's going to be a recipe for some challenges, both in terms of stalled ferment and also in terms of off flavors like sulfur. So those, those are the ones that often benefit the most from supplementation. Um, so for example, if you're doing like a really, really low gravity beer, um, that's when it's most important to supplement with added nutrients. Um, if you're doing, you know, a, a low or even like low-ish gravity like 10 play-doh beer with a belgian strain i would look at that or i would look at adjusting the mashing to ensure that you get um as much fan through as possible uh, we have been measuring fan for some breweries here in ontario just as a as a little bit of a side project and also just trying to understand like what is the baseline in general most breweries are getting uh within a, a good target range of about 220 to 250 ppm um which has been good to see but this is always something to keep in mind with with yeast nutrition um, another key piece here is that North American malts tend to have higher fan than European varieties. This comes down to actually the, the varieties of barley. Um, the malt in North America has largely been, been bred for the large North American beer producers. And it's been, you know, what's called six rowified. So it's been bred for higher enzyme content, um, for example. And, and one of the results of that is that it tends to have higher fan content than a similarly malted European variety. Um, so um, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, we have a little bit of that data on the right as well, where you can see that the Vireman Pills malt is producing the uh, lowest fan content for the wort strength, although it's, uh, it's not that different from the, in this case, the uh, uh, two row malt, um, sort of commodity two row malt in there. Um, and, you know, in this case, the craft malt one, so the Barnell, um, being, uh, craft malt floor malted, um, in this case seemed to have the highest fan content. So, uh, I guess that's a win for them. Um, the great thing with fan is that the multiplier should give you some kind of spec. Um, you'll either get that as parts per million fan in a standard wart, uh, usually of 10 or 12 Play-Doh. Um, so 1040, 1048 or 1044 kind of thing, um, or as total soluble protein or soluble protein. Uh, I see that on a lot of the European spec sheets. It's slightly more annoying to back calculate um, how that's being done, but it can be done. Um, so one way or another, they will tell you, you know, some indication of how much um, nitrogen you're going to be able to get from your malt. So you don't even need to go and, you know, collect data like we did here. You should have a pretty reasonable indication from your malt spec sheets. But there is a caveat. So I just talked about how, you know, most yeast need like between 100 and 200 parts per million of fan. Uh, doesn't mean that you just put in that exact amount and you're off to the races because there's an amino acid that uh, yeast doesn't use. So beer strains don't typically utilize this amino acid proline. Um, they don't have good enzymes to, to basically break up this ring and utilize it for um, building proteins and stuff. Um, so that usually means that the overall fan isn't consumed hundred percent. You usually have some residual, um, and the best practice is to plan for extra excess fan, uh, residual in your work. Um, usually about 30 parts per million extra to compensate for the proline that the yeast is not going to consume. And that's again, something we see from the survey we're doing of breweries in Ontario is, um, we tend to see between 25 and 35 parts per million residual 
uh, fan when the ferments are completed, which is very normal. That's the that's the proline that's left over, basically. Um, so what that means is that you need to build that in. If, you, if a yeast needs 180 parts per million, you should shoot for at least 210 to compensate for uh, the proline. And you can just see in the graph on the right, uh, that line across the top is is the proline in the in this is wine, not wort, but same concept. Um, it's not really being broken down by the yeast while all of the other amino acids uh, or nitrogen sources that they measured are being broken down. So that's our fan. And then we get to minerals. Uh, so I had to throw in a couple. If there's an opportunity for a breaking bad meme, I'm going to I'm going to throw it in here. Um, they're not rocks. They're minerals, uh, but minerals rock for yeast. Minerals give us ions, uh, which includes cations and anions uh, needed for both yeast growth and fermentation. So this isn't a complete list, but these are some of the ones that are important to yeast. That includes phosphorus, sulfur, chloride, potassium, sodium, magnesium, manganese, calcium, zinc, copper, and iron. So we'll get into some of those specific ones, but where do they come from first? Minerals come from our water. Water is the most abundant ingredient in beer. Um, you know, yeah, we're adding other ingredients, but water's the most, the most abundant. And your source water will vary wildly. It will contain varying concentrations of minerals. So from place to place, and even, even uh, over the course of the year, you will see variation in the mineral content of the source water. So I included a few examples here on the right. Um, I included our hilariously hard water here in Guelph, um, which lucky for us is actually kind of perfect water for from a yeast nutrition standpoint, at least. Um, yeast absolutely loves this water. And oftentimes if we have to reproduce a fermentation issue, we have to go and go and, you know, make some work with uh, RO or distilled water because, you know, the yeast is really, really happy in this stuff. Uh, it does pose a lot of other challenges in terms of, you know, um, making every single beer style with hard water is quite difficult um, and controlling pH is quite difficult when you have that much carbonate. Uh, so it's not without its challenges. Um, but there's other examples too. Like you can see Montreal, for example, is like a pretty balanced water profile. Um, but you even get down to like these extreme, extreme other end of the spectrum, like Pilsen, where it's, it's very, very pure. There's very little minerality in the water. Um, and that creates other challenges, right? You might actually see um, some yeast nutrition, yeast yeast fermentation challenges with with a water like that if it's not being supplemented, um, and it also changes from year to year. So, for example, um, in a lot of places that have uh, winter, you know, snow melt will impact the source water. It'll either either dilute it or it will actually leach minerals into the aquifer, um, depending on how the municipality water is managed. So, you know, for us here in Guelph, we actually see minerals spike during snow melt because there's some minerals leaching into the, the aquifers. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well as, you know, uh, it's important to pay attention to water and brewing all the time. I know it's a boring topic, but it's super, super important to everything from flavor through to yeast health. So, you know, that's often the first thing that we will ask about if, um, you know, if we're helping troubleshoot a fermentation issue, um, because it often explains um, some of those challenges. I would say with water, pay particular attention to calcium and magnesium and zinc. Um, zinc is going to be at much, much lower levels um, than the calcium or the magnesium. Like if you're lucky, you've got, you know, 0.1 parts per million or something. And in, in most waters, it's a lot lower, um, most source waters. Uh, but it's important to pay attention from a yeast perspective to the calcium and the magnesium um, specifically. And we'll get into why that is later. Um, beyond the water, your malt is also supplying minerals. Um, it will have its own mineral content. It's also the second most abundant ingredient in the beer. So it plays a really, really big role. But just like with the water, the mineral content of the malt is also variable. So that makes our life as, uh, as brewers trying to control the process uh, a little bit challenging. Um, so here's just some example, because I, I thought that this was cool that this was done. So this is the, from the folks at Montana State University. Um, they actually went and measured mineral levels ion levels of, of not just magnesium and calcium, but a lot of different things um, in some different malts, um, I think produced in the region, but possibly um, in other places in the US as well. 
um, but you do see variation. Um, like in this case, for example, you can see uh, the magnesium levels anywhere from, you know, 70 something PPM up to 120. So a swing of, of almost 30 or 40 percent. Right. And that's true for the calcium as well. So it's important to keep this in mind is that the actual, you know, as you change from malt lot to malt lot and, and crop year to crop year, you might see some changes in the mineral um, contribution by your malt. And a challenge here is that this isn't usually on the spec sheet. Um, so uh, it might be a variable that isn't being controlled that you don't know about, which is always a little bit scary, uh, but just something to keep in mind. So getting into more specifics with some of these minerals, this is one of my favorite topics in case you couldn't tell. Uh, magnesium, uh, really, really important one and often overlooked. So magnesium is involved in yeast growth. Um, typically, if you have more magnesium, it means that the yeast grows faster and ferments faster and completes fermentation better at a lower, you know, at a, at a more complete degree of fermentation. It doesn't leave residual sugars behind. And you can see that in the graph on the right, where um, I think in both cases, it's an ale yeast on, on sort of the left and a, and a lager yeast on the right. Uh, those bottom fermentation curves, the fastest ones, the circles, are ones where the yeast has been supplemented with magnesium. So it really does help the yeast ferment faster and more completely. Um, and that's really important. It's also involved in aroma formation. So uh, magnesium plays a role in aroma formation. Um, and usually that means that you're going to get more esters and less fusels um, when, when the yeast is supplemented with magnesium or has the right balance. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. Magnesium is, is really, really important for yeast growth as well as uh, flavor production. On the other hand, we have calcium, which I think I think this is better known. You know, generally it's 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 pretty well known in the brewing community that adding calcium means that the yeast is going to flocculate more, um, and that's that's what it does. It does also help with yeast growth, but the primary thing we know flocculation for is for sorry, calcium for is flocculation. They're almost interchangeable. Um, calcium also acts as a pH buffer, which is great. It can preserve yeast health, and and because if the yeast isn't uh, dealing with pH changes as much, it's pumping less ions, you know, between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. That's less stress, so the yeast is going to live longer. So you often see, um, um, you, you often see, um, you know, pH buffering having a, a positive impact on uh, on yeast survival over time. Um, that's true for us here in Guelph, where we have pretty pretty calcium rich water. Um, it's also involved in some enzymes and it's a key part of flocculation. Basically calcium helps, um, helps make this whole, you know, cell flocculation thing work. Um, it's, it's a key part of the Velcro of, uh, yeast cells sticking together and flocculating. Um, so it is important. Um, and often brewers will add calcium to their wort to, to encourage a clear beer with more flocculation, although there are some caveats and, and we're gonna get into that in a, in a moment. Because the importance here is really about the magnesium to calcium ratio. Um, this is an area where we've seen this, uh, this as an issue uh, skyrocket because the two most popular beer styles being made now are hazy IPAs and lagers. And this impacts both of those beers um, as a result of the methods used to produce those beers. Um, so really the issue here is that if calcium is too high as a ratio compared to magnesium, yeast performance will suffer. Um, you can see in the chart on the right and like, this isn't new, this, this, this data is, holy crap, this is 40 years old at this point. Um, you can see these are just numbers, but, uh, their generation time and lag phase goes up when there's, uh, more calcium to magnesium, for example. So if we think of, uh, you know, common techniques for making hazy IPAs where you're um, dumping in a, a ludicrous amount of calcium chloride to make the beer softer, um, you have to understand that that's also diluting the magnesium in your wort, and that could have a negative impact on yeast health. So especially when you get into like, I'm sure there's like 40 out of you with this problem right now, you make hazy IPAs, you're using a bunch of calcium chloride and you're getting a really long tail end of ferment and really long hop creep. And you're frustrated that it's taking you nine days to get through your hop creep and you're losing your aroma. 
uh, this might be one of the problems. Um, you can adjust this. You know, you you can put in some magnesium, uh, magnesium chloride or magnesium sulfate from your uh, ingredient supplier. Balance that out, and you'll probably see some improvements to performance. Um, simply because the yeast really likes that magnesium, um, and part of the issue here is that they need that magnesium for growth. So if they're starved for magnesium, you won't get as many cells growing, and um, that actually ends up impacting flocculation because flocculation depends on all of those cells colliding with each other and sedimenting out. If there aren't enough cells to begin with, you can actually have this weird inverse effect where um, you actually get poorer flocculation when there's too much calcium, simply because you haven't grown enough yeast cells to um, collide with each other and settle out. Other critical one is zinc. Uh, zinc is absolutely critical to fermentation performance, um, especially at the tail end of fermentation. So um, this is just one graph to to um, to show that uh, they're basically looking at zinc concentration um, on the x axis there and the time to the end of ferment. And you can see there's a pretty big difference. They didn't test no zinc, um, unfortunately, because there probably was a little bit in the wort. Um, but you can see, you know, in this case, there's there's a difference of as much as two days between a low concentrations of zinc and uh, 0.2 milligrams per liter or parts per million, which is kind of the industry standard. So, you know, a swing of at least 20% um, just based on one ion alone is, is pretty critical. Um, zinc is a cofactor in some pretty important enzymes in, you know, both the brewing process and also um, flavor of beer. So it's a cofactor in an enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase. There's actually a few of them. Uh, what they do is they convert acetaldehyde into alcohol. So um, acetaldehyde is that sort of green apple flavor that gives us a headache and gives us a hangover. Um, that enzyme converts that into alcohol, which is, you know, the thing that we're really looking to consume when we're consuming beer, I think. <laughs> um, it's really, really important to flavor control because acetaldehyde is an off flavor. Um, zinc is also involved in flocculation, so it's also a cofactor in, in enzymes that, that contribute to flocculation. Um, the key thing here is that zinc is typically deficient in barley warts. It's actually there in the malt, but it tends to bind up and chelate with the trub. And then the end result is that, especially if you're you know, on a modern brew house and getting some nice, nice clear wort, um, your wort is probably going to be zinc deficient. Um, so, you know, there are there is a, a whole, I would say, a whole cadre of brewers that um, just add zinc to their wort. And like, there's a reason for that. Um, it's one of the only things that you absolutely need to add. Um, in order to ensure success, but that doesn't mean that adding other stuff won't also improve results. It's just the one thing that you really, really as a brewer need to be adding in, and there's better or worse ways to do that. So um, I just talked about, you know, slow, hazy IPAs. This is another um, another solution there is making sure that the wort has enough zinc, and uh, you need to make sure that it's being added in the right way. So. If you're adding uh, zinc sulfate to your kettle um, on the hot side, um, you're probably gonna lose most of it to your trub. Um, the better solution is to make a sterile solution of zinc and add that directly to your fermenter or use a product uh, like yeast lightning or servomyces that has some uh, zinc uh, that, that will go into solution. Um, and, and we are um, you know, continually updating uh, yeast lightning to work on that zinc concentration as well. So moving on, we get to phosphorus. So I haven't uh, I haven't talked about um, you know um, this one yet, but it's really really important. You actually need a lot of it for yeast. So um, compared to zinc, where literally a dash will do you, um, phosphorus is 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 one of those nutrients that need, yeast needs comparatively quite a lot of. That's why something like diammonium phosphate is so effective as a yeast nutrient. Um, because it, um, in addition to the ammonium, that nitrogen for the yeast, it also contributes phosphorus, phosphate. Um, and it's important because it's needed for, basically needed for life. It's a key component in ATP, which if you remember high school biology, you know that ATP is the energy currency of the cell, or ATP is the pulse of life. Um, that was burned into my brain by my grade 12 biology teacher. Um, it's really important. That's basically how cells make energy, right? 
Uh, it's the thing that you get way more of if you respire, if you use oxygen versus fermenting. Um, so that's really important. It's also the key, a key component in uh, DNA. So in, in the code of life or nucleic acids, which some of those actually serve uh, functional purposes in the cells as well. Um, you have ribosomes that translate DNA. Um, this is quickly turning into a uh, remedial high school biology lesson. Uh, I'm sorry, but that's uh, it all ties into yeast nutrition, um, which is all to say that phosphorus is really important to yeast cells. Um, it needs to be there. If you're if you're missing phosphorus, then you're also going to get insufficient yeast growth. Um, you're going to get insufficient fermentation. Um, but luckily for us, we tend to get the phosphorus that the yeast needs from from the malt. So it's usually there. It doesn't need to be supplemented in in mass quantities unless you're using ingredients that aren't going to have it. So if you're looking at something like a hard seltzer, for example, that's where supplemented uh, phosphorus can help. So um, using a, a new, using you know, diammonium phosphate in addition to a, a complex nutrient like yeast lightning can work quite well in, in that environment. And there are other minerals. You can really go down the rabbit hole and find out what like lead and selenium do in absolutely tiny quantities, but we, we don't really have time for that. Um, but we will talk about a few. So copper is, is uh, an important component of some enzymes. Um, if you have too much copper, that can actually cause issues with yeast metabolism. It can cause lower maltose consumption. It can also cause premature oxidation of the beer. Um, but a tiny amount is really not as, it is really beneficial to fermentation. Um, it, it really does help the yeast. So, you know, there's a there's a, a, a method to the madness with some of these old school copper brew houses where you're actually getting enough copper in the wort just from from the brew house. Uh, or even copper wort chillers when you're home brewing. You know, you might actually see a difference in performance if you switch from a copper chiller to a um, to a stainless steel chiller, um, simply because you're you're actually changing what you're adding to the wort, right? That copper is some of that's going to leach out into the wort, so it's important to keep in mind. And manganese is another one. Um, that's another one where if you, if you have too much, you're going to run into oxidation problems. Um, that's become a known thing with hops where, you know, hop manganese content can cause premature oxidation uh, and manganese in general. Um, it can sub in for some other ions like magnesium and iron. Um, and it is another one that helps with yeast growth and fermentation, although yeast needs typically needs a lot less of it than they do something like magnesium. Okay. And then probably the most mysterious characters that we're going to encounter is our vitamins. Um, most of these are commonly referred to as B vitamins. Um, we probably know that yeast, you know, is a great source of B vitamins in, in nutrition. You know, a lot of people eat nutritional yeast for those vitamins, but we also have to feed them vitamins, uh, to get them in some cases. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. Um, these different vitamins do play different roles in yeast growth as well as enzyme function. Um, and what's important here is just like with fan, we see a pretty big variation in, uh, how much and what types of vitamins the yeast needs. Um, so some yeasts benefit from more of one than another. And, you know, we've seen this in our own propagations and fermentations, and um, we're continuing to do some research to dive into this because, you know, ultimately we want to have the best possible results with as many yeast strains as possible. So, you know, one example is there's some strains that benefit from added um, biotin and thiamine, which is two of the B vitamins. Um, Vermont ale is an example for whatever reason, uh, that strain seems to really benefit from, from added um, vitamins, uh, biotin and thiamine, um, and then some benefit from other ones. So we've seen uh, with our foggy London, uh, riboflavin tends to, tends to be preferred by it. Um, luckily for us, malt tends to have a pretty good concentration of B vitamins, although you know the way that the malt is, that the wort is produced and the malt is produced and the malt source likely does impact the concentration of B vitamins that you're going to get. Um, there's not a lot of data out there on the B vitamin content of wort. Um, we do have, at this point, four or five years of historical data on B vitamin content of malt extracts. So um, there is some, some information that, that we've been able to assemble and we do see variation, right? That is one step removed from the, you know, the malt itself, but it's a pretty controlled process. And 
in malt extract, we see some of these swing by, you know, as much as 40 or 50 percent. So you can see some pretty big variation in the malt um, in terms of the B vitamins, where controlling that can, can certainly help to control uh, and standardize the results that you get in your fermentations. So in summary, um, we have a lot of things that matter. I've kind of cherry picked the things that I think are really important to think about here with yeast nutrition. Um, oxygen is, is so important for growth. Um, nitrogen is important for, you know, certainly for growth, fermentation, everything. Uh, in the case of both of them, if you have too much, you do run a risk of a fermentation being too fast and vigorous, which can have implications for flavor. It, you know, it can be, you know, too much flavor. It can be a bigger pH change. So too acidic. Um, you can, uh, with nitrogen, excess nitrogen, you can get fusels. Um, so there are some limitations there. Um, phosphorus is important. We tend to not have to worry about that too much in beer, but it's definitely important in other fermentations. Uh, magnesium, I'm going to, you know, keep harping on the importance of magnesium. Um, there's a, a lot of fermentation problems that can be addressed by balancing out the magnesium content. Um, the only real downside of magnesium is that it does impact the flavor. If it's really high, it can increase astringency. So again, it's a balancing act because, you know, if you're adding in a little bit of magnesium uh, to compensate for that softening calcium chloride, you don't want to add in too much, but luckily you don't need to. Uh, calcium, we know it for flocculation, but also if there's too much calcium, then it's harder for the cells to take up magnesium. So it's a balancing act. Um, and zinc, you know, we know zinc is critical for a bunch of steps in the fermentation and growth process. Um, it has to be there. If it's not there, your, your, your yeast is not going to reach its full potential. And then vitamins, which is kind of our, our mystery bunch, but, you know, we have some growing evidence that they're quite important for reliability of fermentation. Um, including some of the yeast strains out there that are have, that have become extremely popular um, in the industry. So in summary, we have some hungry, hungry yeasties. Um, I made this years ago and I felt like reusing it. So I'm also gonna get into some of the yeast nutrition issues that you might run into. Um, Cause there's a few uh, and you might've wondered in the past, why did this happen? And I'm gonna try to break it down. So. Number one is poor flocculation. Why does this happen? It usually happens as a result of either insufficient growth or lack of the right enzyme cofactor. Um, so yeah, keep in mind what I said earlier. If you've got yeast in a tank and, and it's not growing enough, you don't have as many particles in solution. And flocculation is dependent on those individual cells colliding with each other. And then those clumps colliding with other clumps, those clumps colliding with other clumps until they have enough gravity that they flocculate and settle out, right? They sink to the bottom. Um, if you don't have enough yeast cells, then it's, it's really just a numbers game and it's gonna take longer for flocculation to happen. So because of magnesium's role in yeast growth, magnesium deficiency can often lead to insufficient flocculation. Um, calcium deficiency can certainly be an issue, but um, I would say, you know, most brewers are, are adding calcium in some way to promote flocculation already. Um, and then zinc can be an issue here as well. If the yeast does not have enough zinc, you'll often see um, issues with flocculation. So you can see on the right an example of a pretty big yeast flock and then a bunch of cells that haven't flocculated together. So, you know, that yeast clump on the left hand side is, is going to settle out of your beer a lot faster than all those individual strains on the right hand side are uh, just simply because of mass. What you can do to help diagnose this. It, if you're getting a beer that's just not clearing up and you look at it under the microscope and you see yeast, um, you can check the yeast at about 24 to 48 hours in a ferment. Basically, when you see your ferment start to take off, you know, the end of your leg time, it might be shorter. Um, and you want to do your cell count and you want to see that you're getting at least four times what you pitched at that point in time. If your yeast hasn't done two doublings or, you know, basically gone four times your pitch rate, um, you're probably getting insufficient growth. So there's something missing up front, whether that's oxygen, magnesium, zinc, fan, something's missing up front that's limiting the yeast from growing in your fermenter. Um, and that is going to put it at risk of, you know, of poor flocculation just because there's not enough yeast in suspension. Um, so one of the fixes there is to make sure that your ions are in balance, make sure that you, you're not 
absolutely, di you know, diluting out your magnesium with calcium in uh, whether that's in a hazy IPA where you're adding a lot of calcium chloride or whether that's in a lager, you know, it's pretty common with lagers for brewers to um, precipitate the temporary hardness in the hot, in the hot liquor tank or, you know, in layman's terms, boil the water. So, so some of the crud comes out. Um, if you're not also adding back in magnesium, keep in mind that what you're precipitating out is going to be a mix of different uh, salts, including calcium and magnesium salts. If you're only going, you know, adding back in a calcium salt, then you're probably starving your yeast of magnesium. So you need to keep that in mind and, and put put some magnesium in. It, it doesn't, it, it can be four to one. It doesn't have to be, you know, one to one necessarily. Um, but this is really important for, you know, what are currently the most popular beers in the, uh, around, at least in, here in Canada, which is hazy IPAs and lagers. Uh, and zinc is important here as well. So that if if you if you think that the magnesium is totally accounted for, the next places to look would be zinc or fan um, to make sure that that yeast is flocculating, or it's just the wrong yeast, and you need to use a different yeast for that fermentation vessel. So this is another. I would say there's probably you know a few dozen people that are going to watch this and and uh, you know slap their foreheads. I hope. Um, because it's a problem that a lot of people have encountered that we, we don't talk about enough, which is the slow tail end of ferment and hop creep, um, which are separate issues, but kind of related to each other. At the end of the day, both of them slow you down, right? So hop creep, what is that? That's basically it's enzymes from your dry hopping, um, converting unfermentables in your wort into fermentable sugars. Um, and the challenge here is that your yeast, if it's really stressed at the tail end of the ferment, is going to need to chew through those. So if the yeast is really stressed out because it didn't get what it needed up front in terms of nutrition, it's going to take a long time to chew through those sugars that the hop enzymes are are releasing. You know, hop grief should not take that long. It should be like three to four days max, um, at least based on on you know uh, the information available to us. And if it's significantly longer, and I've heard of people with you know seven, eight, nine, ten day hop creep. There's probably an upstream yeast nutrition problem that we can solve and shorten your turnaround time and make sure that you're maximizing the aroma of those hops that you're leaving in your tank. Um, and you don't have to take it from me. Um, one of the big proponents of this has been Vinny Chalurzo at Russian River. Um, I heard him talking on a podcast about um, getting faster, getting basically the beer through hop creep faster um, by making sure that the yeast gets proper oxygen and zinc levels and, you know, even though they're a brewery that really knows their stuff, they've been around forever. You know, they they took a critical eye to what they were doing um, and found some improvements to zinc management, uh, including adding uh, zinc directly to the fermenter and reported um, some pretty big efficiency improvements with uh, with hop creep. And you know, slow tail end of the ferment is kind of the same situation. If you're if you're making a lager and your yeast is you know getting down to four or five Play-Doh, you know, 10, 16, 10, 20, and it takes 10 days um, to get down to your actual final gravity. Maybe it's two Play-Doh or 10.08. Um, this is also, there's probably an upstream yeast nutrition uh, opportunity as well. So uh, in the case of loggers, you know, some people have lots of time on their hands and, and that's okay. If, if you do need to get the beer at the door, then you need a solution. And, and that's usually upstream nutrition, uh, zinc in the case of lager yeast, but you know, also taking a critical eye to that ion balance of um, calcium and magnesium. Diacetyl, diacetyl, buttery popcorn. It's another one that's that that can stem from yeast nutrition. So if you're a fan of your wort, your free amino nitrogen is low. Um, yeast has to make more of their own amino acids and a byproduct of this um, can be uh, elevated diacetyl. Another another root cause can be underpitching. So you're putting the yeast through more growth. Again, basically making them have to make more amino acids. Um, diacetyl is the end result of poorly managed amino acid synthesis. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, if you've got healthy yeast at the tail end of the ferment, they're going to be the best at taking up that diacetyl precursor as well. So that's another key thing to keep in mind. If the yeast is unhealthy, they're not going to be able to absorb that. Um, it's called alpha acetolactate. And we have a whole talk on diacetyl, by the way. You can check that out on YouTube um, and many blog posts. Um, 
these kind of acts as a sponge for that alpha acetolactate, which if it's not dealt with, it turns into diacetyl over time with heat. And uh, that's how you get your buttery popcorn beer that you probably don't want. Um, for this reason, because it's often linked to fan and yeast growth, it's often more of an issue in low gravity warts or warts with European malts uh, or high adjunct loads. It's anything with a low fan content, especially if it's low fan and, and uh, a faster yeast growth rate. So probably less of an issue with lagers unless the fermentation is not managed. Um, certainly it's a challenge with, you know, English strains, for example, if you're fermenting warm, um, and it's not getting adequate, uh, nutrition, that's, that's a recipe for diacetyl issues. So something to keep in mind, um, especially with those, uh, those malts or warts that have lower, um, fan content. So if you're like single infusion mashing a European Pilsner malt, um, then you're probably going to be at risk of some, of some diacetyl issues. So this is sort of a continuation of the that like long tail end of ferment thing that I talked about with hop creep. Um, kind of a spectrum with slow and stuck ferment. So yeah, slow and stuck ferment is also, you know, the root cause is, is yeast health. Um, I'll talk about enzymes for a moment here. Um, maltose is brought in into the cell by maltose transporters. They're all called mal genes. Um, so that's pretty easy for the yeast to deal with. But there's another sugar that's that's pretty abundant in wort. It's usually about 20 to 25 percent of the sugars, fermentable sugars in wort, called maltotriose. It tends to be the one that's fermented last, and it has its own special transporter. Uh, AGT1, otherwise known as MOL11, is a different gene, different uh, enzyme transporter, uh, I guess protein uh, rather, that brings uh, maltotriose into the cell. So maltotriose is um, basically maltose with an extra glucose subunit added to it. So there's there's three, hence the, the tri in there. Um, it's just harder for the yeast to ferment. This is one of the cool party tricks of beer yeast in general is they have this transporter, which means they can ferment this malt sugar and, and like wine yeast, for example, usually can't. Um, but one thing to keep in mind here is that if, if there isn't enough fan or enough building blocks to make proteins, the yeast is going to have a much harder time making that transporter, and it's and it only makes that transporter when it needs to, basically. Um, so if it has a slower production of that transporter, it's probably also going to have a slower tail end of ferment. So the root cause of a you know trickling fermentation that isn't caused by hop creep is usually a result of insufficient building blocks for uh, for the proteins. So um, just straight up fan is often often pretty pretty critical here. Um, but there can be other other factors as well, right? If the membranes are really unhealthy because the yeast didn't get enough oxygen, that can also be a root cause of a trickling tail end ferment. Acetaldehyde. So we talked about that a little bit before, um, but acetaldehyde is an off flavor. Uh, you can check out. We have uh, some some really new knowledge base and, and blog content on acetaldehyde if you want to understand more about this off flavor. Um, it indicates an incomplete fermentation because it's basically the stepping stone on the way from sugar to alcohol. In a healthy, complete ferment, it's just turned into alcohol. It's dependent on this these enzymes called aldehyde dehydrogenases, which use zinc as a cofactor. So if you're getting a, a green apple beer and you hate that flavor and it gives you a headache and a worse hangover, which no one wants, um, root cause is likely that the yeast didn't get enough zinc, um, and correcting that with enough zinc in your wort should help, uh, should help, uh, alleviate any issues with acetaldehyde. And, uh, I do often see it with, um, with lager strains. Uh, some of the lager strains out there are pretty notorious for this. Uh, it's important to make sure that the yeast has enough zinc. Otherwise, um, the beer can turn out pretty, um, green apple-y especially because, you know, it's lager, it's a slower, colder ferment. Man, I'm talking about a lot of problems. Hopefully we can solve some for you. Um, poor viability when you're cropping, also uh, or harvesting the yeast, also um, a result of nutrition. Um, so this one has a lot of root causes. Ultimately, it's just poor yeast health. You know, your yeast in a normal beer should be super healthy when it's cropped. Like it should be over 80%, maybe over 90% viable when you do a 
a viability stain. It shouldn't look like what you see on the right where all those pink stained cells are super dead. Um, that can be a result of poor wort oxygenation, right? And not, not enough oxygen means that you might not have the right uh, membrane lipids, sterols for the yeast to be as stress resistant as possible. It might be insufficient fan and uh, content and lipid, you know, by way of oxygen or, or added lipids. You do get a little bit from your malt. Um, if there's not enough fan, that again means that the yeast is limited in its ability to make proteins, which might mean that it can't respond to the stress of the tail end of fermentation as well. Um, mineral balance can play an issue here, just like we talked about. If you don't have, if the cell can't access enough, you know, magnesium, for example, um, it's not going to be able to uh, resist alcohol stress as much. Uh, or you might have restricted growth, meaning that each individual cell is doing more work um, than uh, in a situation where the cells have grown more. Um, alcohol itself can cause this stress too. So, you know, again, all of these nutritional inputs can help the yeast with um, survival in a high alcohol environment. Um, and then also there's other, other factors like hydrostatic pressure, although I, I don't find that that makes a massive difference. You know, breweries can crop from 400 barrel tanks and get better yeast viability than breweries cropping from four barrel tanks, depending on how nutrition is managed. And then fusels so, or like a boozy flavor. So another thing that can give you a headache and, and, a, and a worse hangover. Um, it's a whole class of compounds. We actually have a, a new uh, knowledge base article and I think a blog post on fusels as well. So a lot of information out there from, from uh, Nate, my partner, Nate. Um, it's a funny one because it's a double-edged sword. It can be from either too much or not enough fan. Um, what helps here is that proper zinc levels will help to reduce fusels. Same thing with magnesium. If I sound like a broken record, it's because I am. You know, magnesium and zinc are super critical to optimal yeast performance. Um, what magnesium can do is it can facilitate converting fusels into esters. It's a cofactor in a key enzyme that makes that happen. So by that virtue, it can make the impact of fusels less. Um, so that's really important. Although, you know, maybe you don't want the esters, in which case you have to manage it differently. Um, because it can be a result of too much fan, um, if you're looking to reduce fusels, one suggestion for high gravity beers that are going to have high fan extraction is to actually dilute some of that, that malt with, with a pure sugar. So it's part of why you see that being a tradition in Belgian brewing of just adding sugar because, you know, otherwise you might end up with beers that are too fusely or boozy. If you actually reduce the fan to a level that's appropriate for the yeast and balance that out, you can get a flavor profile that favors esters over fusels. And sulfur, another really annoying one that I taste way too much out there. Um, sulfur aromas, so that like eggy or struck match, those are two different things, but they're, they're sulfur either way. Um, that's also just like with um, the previous uh, fusels, um, it's typically a result of not enough fan. So if you don't have enough fan, uh, the cells have to make their own sulfur containing amino acids, like cysteine is a good example. Um, they have to do that extra work and biology is messy, metabolism is messy. So they end up making a little bit of hydrogen sulfide in that process. So the root cause of sulfur tends to mean, be that the yeast just doesn't have enough nutrition. So again, it's, it's a bigger issue in lower gravity beers. In my experience, you're, you're more likely to run into sulfur issues in a eight Plato beer than you are in a 16 Plato beer, for example. Um, magnesium broken record once again. Magnesium can lead to insufficient growth, which also then means that individual cells are working harder to synthesize amino acids and they're kicking out a bunch of extra uh, hydrogen sulfide. Um, that's also important to, uh, to keep in mind here as well. Um, again, uh, because the root cause is really insufficient fan, a key thing to monitor is yeast growth. Um, so even if you don't have the ability to measure fan, you do, you know, whether, at least if you're in a brewery, you, you should have a microscope. Um, even a lot of home brewers have microscopes at this, this point. Um, one way you can check as a proxy is the yeast growth. If you're getting that 
uh, appropriate doubling. And again, I'm always looking for at least four times the pitch rate um, as a good proxy for, you know, sufficient yeast growth. Um, if you're seeing that, then, then you're probably okay. If you're still getting sulfur, then um, it could be uh, a mineral imbalance or, um, or, you know, you might need to bump up the fan a little bit. If you're seeing insufficient growth at that, um, you know, end of your leg phase uh, into the, you know, real start of fermentation, that's uh, the root cause of your sulfur problems are probably fan. Um, it's a bigger issue at colder temperatures, which is why loggers are uniquely um, sensitive to sulfur. Like if you've got a starved lager yeast and you're keeping that beer cold, then that, that sulfur is going to stick around a little bit, you know, a little bit of sulfur can add some complexity with loggers, which, which makes them, you know, really interesting because you're looking for that balancing act, but too much is, is unpleasant. And in another area where I see this a lot is in session beers, you know, low, uh, ABV beers, low starting gravity, where you're not extracting a lot of fan. Um, specifically, I see it in saisons. If you're using um, European Pilsner malts and uh, making a, a low gravity wort, like you know nine plato or less, and, and pitching one of those yeasts, Belgian yeast or saison yeast that needs a lot of uh, fan, uh, it's kind of a recipe for sulfur. So um, that's that's a place where you can you can adjust that. You can adjust that with diammonium phosphate. Um, or you know, depending on the nutrient, you can add the add a yeast nutrient that'll bump it up a little bit as well. Although um, adjusting fan through just straight up through a complex nutrient is not always the most cost-effective approach. It's really useful to have both DAP and something like yeast lightning on hand to to make your adjustments. So yeah, that was a lot of information, um, and I'm going to talk now about how to make it easy. And the answer is yeast lightning nutrient. Who saw that coming? Um, this is our product. This is our yeast nutrient. It's uh, it's been through a few iterations, and you know we're just trying to keep making it better. Uh, it's going to keep evolving over time as well. But we developed yeast lightning to help standardize beer yeast nutrition in the face of changes in malt, water, and yeast strain. All these things are constantly changing. You do not have the ability to measure all of these things. So the objective of yeast lightning is to make it so that you don't need to and you just get consistent results, even if your malt and water and yeast are changing. Um, and before yeast lighting, there was no yeast nutrient on the market specifically designed for brewing yeast. There are nutrients on the market, but this one is designed through the lens of brewing yeast and what they need. And as we've talked about, they have some slightly different needs, especially when we when we get into the um, vitamins. So, you know, that's kind of my sales pitch for yeast lightning is, it's specific to beer yeast. It's not, you know, developed for wine fermentation and then adapted to brewing like um, many of the other products out there are. Um, and, you know, even if we change the formulation, we're always um, keeping in mind what is important and essential for the brewing yeast to ensure the best possible performance. So what are the benefits? Because of what we just talked about and some of the benefits of yeast nutrition, because uh, basically yeast lighting is going to give you most of what you need, except for maybe oxygen and, you know, some yeast strains need a little bump of zinc. Um, because of what we just talked about, you know, if you're using a complex nutrient, you're running a uh, lower risk of sulfur, you're running a lower risk of diacetyl, you're probably going to get shorter lag times. You know, we actually do have some magnesium in here too. Um, you're going to get faster time through hot creep or tail end of ferment, however you want to look at that, um, and greater aroma potential. Because uh, once again, we're, we're we're making sure that the yeast is properly fed with the amino acids and the ions and vitamins that it needs to reach its full potential. And uh, you don't have to take it from me. There's some pretty cool data out there. Um, so this is um, actually some data that a, that a home brewer collected for us, um, where some Irish ale yeast was compared without nutrient and with yeast lightning. And you can really see... The reason I chose this is because a lot of our ferments were doing like daily gravities and um, they used a, a tilt hydrometer. So it's sort of a continuous uh, monitor. And you can really see what I'm talking about here. Um, you can see that the yeast uh, starts to ferment faster. You can see that lag time, that red curve is going down faster. Um, you can see that it hits final gravity um, at least three days before the, the yeast with no nutrient added does. And especially when we look at that tail end of ferment, you know, between 10:20 and where it finishes, which looks to be about 
10, 13 or so, um, it's finishing so much faster, you know, compared to the control. So you're really seeing all the things that I was just talking about, where if the yeast doesn't have the nutrient it needed, and in this wort, you know, there was something missing, the yeast lightning compensated for, um, you're going to see a longer fermentation. And, you know, on the commercial side, um, that has ramifications in terms of, um, you know, your ability to get beer onto the market efficiently, which I think is becoming a much more critical focus, uh, certainly this year versus, versus, you know, any time in the past for craft beer, right? We have to be efficient um, because the market isn't making it easy for us. What else? Oh, this is really cool. Um, so also uh, yeast lightning can lay claim to contributing to the world's fastest beer. Um, so these guys in the UK, the craft beer channel, um, they tried once without yeast lightning and it didn't work very well. And then they used yeast. They did make some other changes. I'll give them credit for making some other process changes. Um, but they did actually use yeast lightning in the, uh, to my knowledge, the world's fastest beer grain to glass. Um, they used four times our recommended rate and brewed their beer, fermented, carbonated, all in the span of 36 hours. Uh, so you can actually watch this video on YouTube, check it out. Um, pretty cool. And just shows, shows the power of, of, you know, using yeast nutrition, um, especially if you're against the clock. Um, and that's my challenge also is, can you beat their record? I would love to see that. And, uh, there's probably some free yeast lightning and some swag in it for you if you do it. Um, and also a testimonial here. So I'll stop my sales pitch in a moment, but um, really are seeing some positive impacts in breweries. Um, again, you know, wort malt should have everything it needs. Sometimes it doesn't. So nutrient is a great insurance policy and, and it's good to use a nutrient that keeps what brewing yeast need in mind, right? So uh, this is one from Josh at, at North Brewing Company, um, basically saying that they're getting faster, cleaner, more reliable ferments. Um, and also important to the commercial brewers, getting more generations or getting more reliable number of generations. And the last thing we want is someone's yeast suddenly crapping out and it's Thursday and we've got to get yeast out the door, you know, for, for Friday. So we're not waiting over the weekend. That's pretty stressful. So, you know, let's try to eliminate stress all around if possible. So where can you find it? Same place you can find all of our stuff. If you're in Canada, you can buy directly from us. If you're international and you're a, brewery, a pro brewery, you can buy directly from us. Uh, if you're home brewing, you can buy directly from us in Canada uh, or go to your local homebrew shop um, in the U.S. Uh, we're available at Great Fermentations and we have uh, a bunch of, a bunch of uh, regional homebrew shops um, starting up uh, with our product line as well. Um, as well as uh, Europe, you have Hembrigger in Sweden and there's a few others as well. Um, you can check out our website for a full list of our homebrew distributors. And if you want to learn more, a bunch of the stuff that I talked about today is on our knowledge base. So you can uh, find that from our website or just go to knowledgebase.escarpmentlabs.com. Check that out. There's a lot of cool information in there that I think will help you uh, make better beer. And we have a few more webinars coming up. Um, we're officially at the halfway point of this series um, that I signed myself up for. And it's been a lot of fun so far. It's like really cool seeing a lot of the same uh, folks in the chat. Uh, we've got a little community going here and I, I love it. Uh, a few more coming. So we're gonna be talking about non-alcoholic beers next week. I'm gonna take a break um, for the Labor Day weekend. Um, and then we're gonna be back on September 11th talking about controlling beer off flavors. So kind of the opposite end of what we just talked about, but getting more into uh, how these things actually work and practically uh, controlling them. And then we're also going to talk about, uh, which, you know, this talk is almost a prerequisite for now, using beer yeast in things that aren't beer, cider, seltzer, sake, wine, and mead. And so much of that is going to hinge on nutrition. So we're going to be able to build on what we just learned about how to keep beer yeasts happy and fed. And we're going to learn how to use them in a lot of other places. And that's really exciting too. And that's it for this talk. Uh, thank you for checking, uh, checking this out live. Um, if you have any questions while we're still here live, um, keep in mind that you can ask questions using the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, I did see a couple come through in the chat, so I will uh, address those while we wait for any questions to come in. Um, and I'll answer a few questions, and then we'll sign off, and uh, we'll have a happy Monday.
So the first question that I see, at least in the chat uh, from Jacob, is how best for small breweries to measure fan? Um, so I did talk about that a little bit in the in the in the um, presentation, but one decent proxy for your fan is is checking that cell count. Um, once 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 your leg phase has ended and your beer has started fermenting, um, that's a good one. Um, you can send it out to get it measured. There are uh, service labs in a lot of different places. I'm not sure where you're located, but um, there are. It's a fairly simple assay um, for anyone who has a a UV vis spectrophotometer, uh, which a lot of you know a lot of breweries do, and certainly any like lab service company is going to have that. Um, if you have a local brewery that's you know of a certain size, I would say probably 40, 50,000 barrels or bigger, uh, they probably just have that equipment in house. So they might already be measuring fan, or if they're not, then they have the equipment to do so. Uh, you can buy kits even to do the measurement. So um, I think we use one that's that's actually for Yan um, from, from a company called Megazyme. Uh, there's other kits out there as well. Um, and that's actually great because like you can even do wine analysis, right? And get your fan plus your ammonium, um, which is quite useful all in one, one uh, kit. And it's not that expensive. Um, if you're in Canada and with a little bit of planning, uh, we can always do fan uh, analysis for you as well. Uh, it is a service that we do offer to our customers. Um, uh, currently, just sort of based on conversation as a courtesy, because we want to make sure that your wort has uh, what your yeast needs. And uh, as we see the malt supply diversifying, like there's a lot of people using a lot more local craft malt uh, or re even regional malt suppliers, which is awesome. But it also means that like, we can't just go and test two malts and assume that everyone's fermentations are gonna be good um, at the start of the year. So it's useful to check, uh, to be able to check that. So if you are in Canada, uh, you can get in touch with us and we can find a way to get your fan, wart fan measured and even look at residual too. We've got some people sending us, you know, wart before fermentation and then finished beer. And we can actually then calculate that gap and, you know, say, okay, I yeast is doing what we expected or not. Diego asks, will this be up on your website to view again later? Of course, we upload all of these to YouTube. So you can always check these out after the fact on YouTube in perpetuity. All right. I don't see much coming in. If you do have any questions after the fact, uh, you can always, always comment on YouTube or uh, send us an email. Um, although I did just see one come in. Thomas asks, favorite beer this summer? And I've got to think about that for a second. Um, I've had some pretty good ones. So this is going to sound like a really strange answer, but all summer, my, my, local, my local is is a, is a pub in Guelph called The Woolly. Um, Historically, they specialize in like in English beer. They've always had cask for like 25 years or something. Um, it's an awesome place um, with COVID, like COVID kind of did some damage to the cask business. So um, they put in a couple, a few nitro lines, um, which kind of, it's great because like you get the, a bit of that cask experience, like lower carbonation. It's obviously it's not the same thing, um, but it scratches that itch. Um, and they've always got beers on nitro. And I think all summer they've had um, a stout from Great Lakes Brewing in Toronto um, on, on nitro. And you know, that's a weird choice for beer of the summer, but that's what I've drank the most of. So I'm, I'm going to go with that. Yeah. Uh, nitro stout is uh, paradoxically the beer of the summer for me. Is there a best? Oh, that's a great question, actually. Okay, let's answer that first. Diego. Is there a best water profile for yeast starters? Kind of confidential information. There's, we, we have opinions. Like I would keep the ratio of ions in check. Like if you're doing a yeast starter, consider bumping up the magnesium above what you would use in brewing, for example. Uh, that's just a, a hint. Um, I wouldn't add much calcium, for example. And uh, certainly make sure, you know, propagating just like fermenting, make sure it's got what it needs. Um, yeast lightening is just as relevant in propagation, if not more. Um, 
we actually developed it originally as a nutrient for our propagations and then found that it also worked quite well in um, in just beer fermentations. So um, it's excellent for propagation. I use it. I would use it at a, at a higher rate, um, about four or five times the uh, beer rate, because in propagation, you're producing a lot more cells. Right. So you need to add more nutrient. Um, so that's another, you know, kind of all in one way to improve propagations. And I know a number of breweries um, are using yeast lightning, even some quite large breweries are using yeast lightning in their propagations because um, they found that it improves the consistency of that process. <laughs> we got another good question from Caleb. Um, sulfur off flavors are common in thialized yeast beers since thials are sulfur containing compounds. Would having yeast nutrients supplemented thialized yeast, also known as healthier yeast, reduce the sulfur or make more of it? That's a really good question because in the case of a thiol enhanced yeast, um, I can't use thialized because it's trademarked. Uh, thiol enhanced yeast. Um, you want some of the sulfur, right? You want the thiols, which are sulfur containing compounds. But what you don't want is for the yeast to be making, uh, making uh, a bunch of hydrogen sulfide. So if you look at uh, how that yeast metabolism is wired, it does depend on the strain. You know, there's different strains out there. Uh, for enhancing thiols. Um, we'll use the example of a yeast with an active IRC7, like, um, like Thio Libre. Um, if the yeast has an active IRC7, that's the beta lyase enzyme that's going to um, basically break off cysteine from a bound thiol and make that aroma active. We talked earlier about how cysteine is uh, the thing that the yeast is making that produces hydrogen sulfide. So uh, one way to think about this is that if the yeast has, it's tricky. If the yeast has enough cysteine, then there's a risk that that uh, beta lyase enzyme is not as active. So that's where some of the different approaches to ensuring that there's a lot of beta lyase enzyme around through overexpressing the gene um, or ensuring a high copy number of the gene, which is, um, there's products out there where they overexpress the gene. In the case of Thiol Libre, it, it has a high copy number. Um, that just ensures that, you know, regardless of the nutrition environment, there's more enzyme around to do what we want. Um, you certainly can, especially when you look at like how this system functions normally, like the reason it exists is that the yeast has this method to get cysteine, right? Um, rather than having to synthesize it itself. Um, the context is in, you know, in a, in a fermentation environment where nutrients are limited. So um, there is the risk for that sulfuriness. And like, certainly if you pitch one of these thiol enhancing yeasts into a wort that is, you know, perhaps it's low in fan, for example, um, there is a higher risk of sulfur and, you know, just because a yeast has a new feature aromatically doesn't mean that it's immune to the other rules of brewing. Uh, so this is an extremely long-winded answer, but I think it's an extremely good question because um, we certainly have seen that, right? Um, some strains are more prone to it than others. I will say I'm extremely happy with the current version of Thio Libre, um, the current version that, that has no risk of phenolics. Um, because of the more robust strain background, it, it, in my experience, has quite low risk of uh, volatile sulfur production, um, but other strain backgrounds might have more challenges. So once again, it makes it, you know, it makes sense to make sure that it's got nutrients. I don't think that any strain background that would be dependent on starving yeast for thiol production is a good idea. And, and I don't think any of them are intended that way. Um, so I would uh, always make sure that the yeast gets enough nutrients. Um, even if it comes at the ex like slight expense of, of thiol production, although I haven't seen much data on that in beer, um, but you know all the all the teams working on thiol production are really smart and really good at research, so I'm sure we'll see some more data as time goes on. Okay, that's it. I think we're going to wrap this up. Thank you for listening to my long-winded response about thiols and sulfur metabolism and yeast nutrition. Uh, Maybe we'll get into that more in detail in a future webinar. Cheers.